Fresh, beautiful veggies from a well-managed greenhouse are a delicious and nutritious addition to your table. Producing these vegetables is hard and detailed work. As a result, farmers need to charge more for the produce. Therein lies a significant challenge. Will wholesalers support those prices? Will consumers? In Canada, most producers sell their products into the well-established food supply system. And when they sell into that system, they are competing with vegetables from California and Mexico where they're growing in significant quantities. So the price the farmer is paid fluctuates based on the market supply. For some farmers, that price won't support the cost of their operations because they're small, and that leaves them with few options. Two are just stop farming, or they could opt out of the system and sell directly to consumers. For those consumers, these products are highly sought after because the product is delivered from farm to table and it isn't touched by very many hands. Farmers markets play host to a number of producers who have decided to grow, package and sell their products directly to consumers. However, it's also a lot more work. In addition to nurturing the plants to maturity, the farmer needs to design and source packaging. They also need to complete the packaging process and then transport it to market. And once there, they need to set up their site and sell. As Dawn Bushert of Shirley's Greenhouses says, it's a lot of work. But for her, because she is small, it is the only way she can survive financially. She says we can't produce at a rate that competes with imported prices. We invited Ms. Bushert to join us for a conversation that matters about the work of operating a greenhouse in Canada and why it is important that she and others take on the arduous task of complementing the food supply system. Conversations That Matter is a partner program of the Centre for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the following and viewers like you. Please become a patron at conversationsthatmatter.tv. Don, thank you for joining me on Conversations That Matter. Oh, thanks, thanks so much for having us. You're coming to us from your greenhouse. Uh, where are you located? So we're in Didsbury, Alberta, or just outside of Didsbury, Alberta. And there goes my cell phone. Oh, yeah. You have to turn Sorry. That off. Yeah. Can I just answer it real quick? Yeah. Hello? Yes. Yes. Yes, but can we, I'm just in the middle of an interview. Can you call me back in an hour? Perfect. Perfect. Sounds great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. Yeah, bye. It just never stops, does it? Yeah. Yeah. The phone keeps ringing. That's the way it well, goes. Yeah, totally. It's busy and, and uh, we're really into local food and we've got, we're selling in several locations. So today set up. We're direct marketing all, you know, our vegetables in three different locations. So I've got three different staff in three different locations that rely on me to, you know, problem shoot and troubleshoot and things like that. Direct marketing. What do you mean by direct marketing? We don't sell to grocery stores. Grocery stores don't actually get our produce. How come? Why not? Um, so I'm a second generation producer. I grew up in the industry. My parents had long English cucumbers. Um, they had, um, we're a 36,000 square foot greenhouse. They were a 26,000 square foot greenhouse. They grew long English cucumbers. They sent them to the warehouse, the warehouse to the grocery store, the grocery store to the customer, and they made a great living. So 13 years ago, they sold their farm. We built this one and we were going to do the same thing. Long English cucumbers to the grocery store. Um, or to the warehouse and, and do the same thing. Um, but what happened was uh, prices had dropped, labor had rid risen, we're too small of a fish in such a big pond to survive in that, in that marketplace. And so the straw that broke the camel's back for us was we were offered $5.25 from a warehouse for a dozen cucumbers in the month of March when we have our big $10,000 gas bill due. And we said to the warehouse, we said, well, that doesn't even pay our bills. And they said, well, take it or leave it. We can get it from Mexico for that price. So we started making changes. And so when was it that you started to move away from the supply system that is the norm in Canada to becoming an independent producer and retailer? Uh, it started about 10 years ago, eight, 10 years ago, for sure. Slow start. Yes, little bit by little bit. You can't just, you know, bite off a big, big bite and then... That's not a great line, but yeah. Slow, slowly, it, yeah. it happens slowly. So, so you start to sell those same cucumbers you were offered pennies for, 
what's the difference in the value to you when you start to go directly to market? That is a great question. And so we, at the, at the, at the warehouse level, let's say an average price, 525 is a low price, an average price might be $7 per dozen. And then the warehouse will turn around and sell it to the grocery store for ten to twelve dollars a dozen, and then to the to the consumer at you know anywhere from fifteen to twenty four dollars a dozen. We charge anywhere from eighteen to twenty four dollars a dozen direct to consumer because we can have it to their in their on their tables within you know two days. So it looks like the lens is fogging up a bit because there's a lot of humidity in the greenhouse. Uh, can I get you to uh, wipe off the lens? For sure. For sure. Yeah. Just back to the question, what is the difference to you as a producer in being able to sell direct to consumer rather than through the system? Now on our farm, we do it also a little bit differently. We don't focus so much on high, high production and high, high yields. We, on our, in our greenhouse, grow without pesticide unless certified organic product is used. And so our customers want to know that we didn't spray them with herbicide, but that would kill them anyway. Um, it would kill any, any plant in a greenhouse, herbicide would. Um, and then we don't use fungicides or insecticides unless they're on the certified organic list. And the biggest thing we use as pesticides in our greenhouse is bugs. So we spend thousands of dollars every year on good bugs to eat the bad bugs. I one more time, quick, uh, quickly uh, wipe the lens there. Uh, this is going to be the, the drill, but that's, that's good. Okay, bugs. Uh, why bugs? What do, what do bugs uh, bring to the equation? So they bring natural, like it's natural, a predator versus prey. So in our peppers, usually we get, we get aphids. And so we will buy ladybugs to eat the aphids. Ladybugs are superheroes. Aphids are, are, are terrible. We also use things like fiddle-ladies, which is like a, a little worm that will, that will eat the aphids. Or colmani, which is like a stinging little parasitic wasp. And it'll sting the aphid and kill it. Wow. So this is an ecosystem inside a bubble. It is. So a lot of people say, oh, you're in a greenhouse, so you don't have bugs. And the opposite is true. We have bugs because this is a perfect system. We control the temperature. We control the humidity. We control the, you know, every, every aspect in here is controlled. And so it's like a little, like, bubble. It's good for the plants, but it's also good for the bugs. And so we, we end up with good bugs and then ba or bad bugs, and then we bring in the good bugs. So every greenhouse in, our indus in the industry uses good bugs to control the bad bugs. So the, that row of plants that's behind you, what is that? So these are peppers. And so, um, yeah, a little tidbit of information on peppers. These are red pepper plants, you can see. So they always start off, you can see here, green, and then they turn red. Or we also have orange pepper plants and yellow pepper plants. People think sometimes that peppers go green, yellow, orange, red. Nope, they go green, orange, or green, yellow, or green, red. Huh. How long does it take for a pepper plant to start to produce peppers? So peppers are the longest crop in the greenhouse. And so we, our plants are seeded in British Columbia in November. And we get them, they come on a truck through the mountains in January. We get them in the beginning of January. Um, and then we, uh, we get, um, sorry, they come on a truck uh, through the mountains and we get them in January. And we don't pick our first colored pepper till mid-April sometimes. So it's a very long producing crop. So you wonder why peppers cost so much? That's why it just takes so long to get a good, firm, nice pepper. And how long will that plant continue to produce during the year? So we have one crop per year in the greenhouse. So we get them in November, start picking in April, and they will pick right through into November, December. Wow. Yeah. So there's a pretty good yield. Yes. Yes. How many pounds of peppers would you produce? You have Why your... are you asking me hard questions? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well... I, I'm trying to understand what's the volume of food you produce, especially now that we're in the midst of the Corona-19 crisis. You're playing a vital role in the food supply system. And in the past, you were a small farmer that didn't get a lot of attention, but now people are noticing. So I'm trying to get a sense of how much you can actually produce. And so if I was a big greenhouse, I would have computer systems here and we'd be weighing it out at the end of every row, but we're a little greenhouse. so. I would say that we would pick, I don't know, it's hard to say, three or four tubs a couple times a week of, of peppers. Um, 
That's a really hard question, sorry, for, for our operation. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. But it's enough to make it uh, a viable. It works uh, for yes. you. And the reason it works for us is because we're able to take our peppers that might not be perfect and people will still buy them. People are connected to our farm. They're connected to us through stories and through videos that we show and things like that. And so we were able to get that higher dollar amount. So that's how we're able to keep our lights on and the bills paid is, is, to, is to direct market it. And so in this whole COVID thing, um, I've, ha I've received phone calls. Hey, you have food. Um, are you still able to sell? You know, I'm a little worried about the grocery stores and supply. And there is a lot, of, like in Alberta, we have enough to supply Alberta with cucumbers, tomatoes, and peppers. But there is that, that val validity to that, to that question because in Alberta, we do still import so much produce. And so we rely on other countries to bring in all that produce um, to, to feed us in Canada. So you are fill, filling a niche market for those who can afford your produce. For those that can afford it, yes. But I find that our prices are similar to, to a grocery store. Maybe mm -hmm. not, maybe not a, a, am I allowed to say Walmart? Sure. <laughs> Maybe not a Walmart type store where it's, you know, the, the, the lowest price possible, but we do compete with some, you know, higher end chains of grocery store, but we also compete on quality. So uh, from us, I always tell my customers, uh, my expectation of our produce is that it lasts a week. If it doesn't last a week, you eat what you can, you compost the rest, you let us know, we replace it up, no questions asked, because that's, that we, it's, a, it's built on relationship and built on on teamwork and so i have high expectations and my customers in turn have high expectations and they're not throwing anything out do you also supply the restaurant market yes i i do but to a very small selection of restaurants if i'm really good friends with a chef i'll i'll supply there but most times restaurants are not um, a fit for our farm particularly because they only need one case of tomatoes or they only need you know and most of my stuff just uh, the farmers markets is where it's been for us it's probably just as well in this covid crisis because it would have had an impact on your business because those restaurants have had to close oh and i feel so bad for them like i just this whole covid thing has thrown our 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 local economy just for a loop so this work is fairly labor intensive it is. How many people do you have working for you? Um, so in the winter time, we keep only about two or three on staff. In the summertime, max summer, we're 12 people full-time plus. 12 people in? On the farm, full-time plus. Holy smokes. Yes. It takes many hands to do this work. And, and yet there are large monocrop farms that have a smaller workforce than you have. So anything that you have to pick by hand is labor intensive. And, and those 12 people, I mean, we do 15 acres of field crops. So each one of these little plants are transplanted into plastic out in the field. That takes a body, you know, and then we, we also weed. We pick the weeds out of the rows by hand. That takes a body. And so, um, yeah, anything you pick uh, or weed manually, that's, it's a lot of man hours. Whereas like grain crops, you just, you know, do a pass with your tractor, one person and and I mean, that takes less people. Yes, yes, but feeding different markets for different purposes. Absolutely, everything's important. We all, you know, we need our wheat for our bread, but we also need our vegetables for our salads. Do you have challenges getting the workforce you require? We do. What are the biggest obstacles ensuring that you can get the people you require who have the ability, the experience, and the care that will ensure that your product will get from the plant to the market? So I hire lots of local Canadians. Um, my Canadians, they do my retail locations. They um, help market things. They do the packaging. Uh, they, do, they do the picking some. But when it comes to the real, like, in the trenches grunt work, um, we actually rely on Mexican workers. Um, I've had, I've had uh, and, you know, this is, this is conversations that matter. I've hired Canadians for the field. They show up for one day. They work for one day, and I couldn't even tell you their name because they did not come back to do the work the next day. Yeah. Really? It is hard to find Canadians that want to do that kind of, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> I, get, I get Canadians phone me all the time. They say, oh, I like gardening. And I say, okay, but do you like gardening on steroids? Do you like to pick weeds in the full sun for eight hours on a day, in, a, in a day? Like it's gardening on steroids. It's not your backyard gardening, it's gardening on steroids. It's heavy, hard, 
physical labor. Mm -hmm. And so it takes the right kind of person that will do that for, and again, the margins on, a, on any farm are, are, are like this, are tight. And so, you know, it takes a special person to be able to do grunt, physical, hard labor for minimum wage. Like so many others in agriculture, do you have challenges getting your workforce into the country? Uh, I was a little nervous this year because with the COVID thing, they shut down the borders. And actually what, the, what our Canadian farmers did, because Canada brings in, you know, thousands of workers into Canada to do these grunt, hard, hard physical jobs. And so uh, the farmers actually went to the government and one of the first things they said is, fine, if you don't bring us our workers, we're not planting crops. And so the government actually, thankfully, has opened up borders and um, allowed us to bring in guys. And so I just picked two guys up from the airport just the other day and we all wore masks in the car and I received three phone calls from the Canadian government of how we're gonna you know, deal with this. And I, they're in quarantine, I put them in jail. Yeah. I mean, they've got food and they've got yeah. bathrooms and they got beds and they got you know, Wi-Fi and all that, but they're, they're quarantined for two weeks and then they're allowed out to come on and work on the farm. And you need them. And I need them because you can't get the same. Some of the guys that come from Mexico to some of the farms, they've been coming for 19 years in a row. You can't just replace 19 years worth of, of you know, experience just with a Canadian worker just overnight. Like, yeah. we need these guys. Well, we look at your form of farming and its role in the overall food supply system in the midst of the current crisis. How do we characterize just how important it is? Uh, it's so important because, again, like we do have Canadians. Uh, I sell into our local, you know, customer base and it, it, it drives our dollars. It keeps our dollars in, in Canada. We're not, you know, importing this stuff. Like there, there is no reason in my mind that Canada should ever import a tomato except in the months of January, February and March in the wintertime because Canada can supply Canada in the greenhouse industry with tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers. Wow, it's a very, very interesting life, isn't it? It is, yes. Would you recommend it to anybody? <laughs> it depends on the day. Well, you've been through the, oh, this looks like an interesting uh, venture. Uh, it's yes. an extension of your family history. For sure. I, I think we can make a go of this and then you start to run into the challenges yes. and the, and the long-term yes. constant innovation. For sure. Is it something that, uh, be, that there's no doubt we need it. Oh. I gotta make a phone call on that oh, okay. one. Okay. <laughs> they... No, the air came back. It's the CO2. We pump CO2 in to get the production. Yeah. So we burn natural gas to put CO2 back into it because we need more. Yeah. Isn't that interesting, hey? Okay, we're back. You turned off the CO2 burner. So we actually, this is a really interesting fact. We actually burn natural gas we just burn it and put extra CO2 into our environment to make our plants, you know, grow, grow and more, you know, get more fruit, more, more food. Well, it's an essential element in photosynthesis. It is. Yes. Without it, plants don't grow. Yes. So to what concentration do you uh, bump up the CO2 level in the greenhouse? Uh, I don't know. That's a him question. <laughs> We just bump it up enough to just uh, to just give it an extra boost. You know, plants plants eat the CO two, then they give off oxygen. So right. Yeah. So, yeah. but it's vitally important. It is very important. Yes. Because without it, you wouldn't be able to do this. Well, we would just be relying on atmospheric CO two, and there's not enough in our in our atmosphere to, uh, you know, keep our. We want more. Right. Yeah, because we want more 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 production. Because the bills are high in here, you know, the natural gas bill and things like that. So we need high yielding, high production um, plants in, in the greenhouse to, to, to pay, to offset those costs. Does the natural gas perform two functions? One, heat the greenhouse, and two, provide additional CO2. Greenhouse, yes. I'd now like to talk about the role of computers in your greenhouses. What functions do computers control to ensure you can maintain the right environment? Everything. So there's a computer attached to a weather system, uh, and that's the brains of our entire operation. So it tells, because uh, it's a hydroponic system. So what hydroponics is, we, uh, we send a water sample away, we get it back, we add all the nutrients that the plants need to grow. So people, or plants need nutrients, things to feed it to grow, whether they get that, the, the nutrients from soil or from dirt, or they get it from, you know, 
um, the, the elemental fertilizer that we feed them. So all the, you know, Epsom salts and, you know, calcium and magnesium and iron. We, we add those perfect blends to, to, our, to our mix. And that's and, the and nutrients. And nitrogen. And nitrogen, yeah. Yes. And we feed that to our plants to grow. So it's, it's perfection. Um, where was I going with that? Like it, you were talking about what the computer controls. Oh, the controls. computer system. So, the so that's one of the things It's making sure that the right nutrients are getting to the plant at the right time. Yes. And mm -hmm. so um, the computer will uh, see how much sunshine there is. And then the, the, it will tell the computer, the computer will tell the system, okay, water so many milliliters per so many hours based on how much sun um, and it just depends on the day, depends on the hour. So it's constantly reading. Um, sometimes you hear that little noise. Well, that's the roof opening. And so the roof will open up a little bit. Oh, it's getting a little bit too hot. So the roof will open up. And then, oh, it's getting a little too cold. So then the roof will close down. And so that's how we can control the temperature in here. And get to give people a product they can feel safe about. After all, we are now living in the safety state. People want to know that the products that they are going to consume are safe to eat. Yes, so know your farmer. Um, so even when you go to farmer's markets, the next, the next, so local has been a big trend in Canada right now. And I personally would like to see the next trend as transparency in food. So not just buying local, but the transparency this is who grew it. This is where it came from. This is when it was picked. This is how it was grown. And the transparency behind that in how, how food is produced. And these are questions that every consumer has the right to ask. Yes. So when a, when a consumer goes to a farmer's market, let, a farmer's market, let's say, ask those questions. Ask who grew it, where did it come from, when was it picked, how was it grown. Can I come to your farm? People ask me all the time, can I come to your farm? And I say, yes, Alberta does Alberta Open Farm Days, and you're more than welcome. I'll give you a tour that weekend, and we'll show you around, and we'll let you see what we do. Um, we also do um, uh, social media. So Instagram, Facebook, and so I do videos on those, you know, showing people what we do and, and how we do it and why we do it. And where can they find you? So Shirley'sGreenhouse.com is our website or on Facebook, Shirley's Greenhouse, or on Instagram, Shirley's Greenhouse. Well, I'm sure that you're going to get some additional followers. Thank, thank you. you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Thank you so much for having us. I appreciate it.